Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. I am Leah Hines. I'm the Executive Director of the Charleston Conference. And today we're presenting Content Has Its Own Tale, the story of the Cambridge history of the American Civil War. And I'm joined by Debbie Gershinowitz, who is Senior Editor, Cambridge University Press. Hi, Debbie. And Aaron Sheehan-Dean, who is History Department Chair at Louisiana State University. Hi, Aaron. Hello. So thanks very much to both of you for joining us today. Um, while our uh, attendees are joining and getting everything set up, I'm going to give a quick poll question for our attendees. Um, what type of attendee are you? If you could just click to let us know, um, academic librarian, medical librarian, special, public, other, publisher, vendor, um, or if you, if you select other, give us a, a little quick explanation in the attendee chat of what the other is. <laughs> so, so far, it looks like 86% academic librarian. So that's, that's about par for the course for us. I'll give everybody a few more minutes. If you also want to use the attendee chat to give us a quick hello and give us your name and where your, uh, what your institution or your school is, we'd like to, to say hello and see who all is here with us. You can use the chat for that. Um, okay, I'm going to end the polling. It looks like we're ending up with 86% academic librarians and 14% publisher vendor. So thanks everybody for doing that. We'll have a couple of other questions at the end um, as well. So with that, I'm going to turn things over. Oh, well, one brief announcement. So the Q&A for this, we will have questions at the end of the presentation. So you can use, there's a, um, a Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen. You can, as uh, you have a question that comes to mind during the presentation, go ahead and enter that question in and we'll save them for the end after Aaron and Debbie have done their talks. Um, but just before you forget, before it leaves your mind, if you're anything like me, you got to write it down while it's fresh in your mind. Um, go ahead and use that Q&A button and we'll, we'll do questions at the end from both of our presenters. Uh, so thanks, Aaron and Debbie. And I will turn it over to Aaron, or to Debbie for the slides. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Leah and Aaron and Charleston and everybody who um, put this together and especially thanks to the participants. Um, I know it's the beginning of the term and you're probably all really busy, so it's really kind for you to be here and we'll make it a worthwhile hour. Um, so I am Senior Acquisitions Editor at Cambridge University Press and I focus on American and Latin American history. Um, and I actually, I, I'm gonna ask a question you can answer in the chat, I guess, a, a general, I'm gonna pepper this with some questions. Um, just is kind of a show of hands or say something in the chat, you know, just are the participants are, are you familiar with the Cambridge history brand? Just as, as a, as a product and Leah, I don't, I don't know how I will see that or if I'd see that later. Oh, sorry, I can't see the chat. <laughs> um, okay, so it looks like um, right now we have uh, some that are not familiar and some that are familiar. Um, so that's good. So for those of you who don't know, um, Cambridge History, Cambridge University Press does a lot of different product types. And one of what I would call one of our marquee products is uh, are the Cambridge Histories, which are reference volumes at that go way back, probably decades before I was born, and they are on big topics um, in history. Um, across the globe, um, we, they range from wars to um, historic eras to, um, you know, now we're getting a little more thematic. We, we have some on you know, one on communism, um, we have one in progress on nationalities. So it's, they are reference books and um, certainly for the history team here at Cambridge, they have been one of our, our highest regarded projects. And um, we are really committed to them here at the press because um, it's something that many librarians understand um, and use and also some general readers do as well. Um, we know that these have appeared in some 
general libraries. And the whole idea of a Cambridge history, and Aaron will talk more about this, is that um, they're narrative. Um, they are multi-contributor, but they are narrative. So I always say the best, one of the best ways to explain what it is is what it's not. They're not handbooks. Um, handbooks we've seen are, they've been around for a while. I thought we were gonna see a little dip in them, but I don't see any of that. I mean, you know, you know, OUP and um, has a ton out there. You know, Wiley has a lot, you know, and handbooks, I feel personally, they're more, they have narrative, but it's more of a mix of a few other things as well, including, um, bibliographical essays, you know, or, you know, historiographic essays that we historians would call them. So they're, they're, they do more, um, which has its own value. But the Cambridge histories really try, our aim is to tell a story, to tell a really comprehensive story, um, drawing on the best storytellers that we can find, um, namely, you know, academic historians, and in some cases, some independent historians, but people who are the experts in a certain slice of history. So that's what those are. Um, I was very interested in, uh, so I joined the press seven years ago, and uh, we didn't have that many Cambridge histories that focused on American history. And it's really been my goal to fill in those gaps. I mean, any acquisitions editor is always looking for gaps, you know, like what, what's a book that people would want to read or feel like they need to teach or just has to have in their collection. And I am looking for that regardless of what I publish, whether it's a, just a, a regular book or if it's a textbook or if it's a multi-volume reference product. Um, in this case, I, you know, I have a slate of projects that I want to sign that I think are important to the story of American history. And, you know, when I think of American history, you know, Civil War and World War II are the books that appear in bookstores, you know, when you meet, you know, when I, when I tell people I'm a history editor, you know, like people next to me on an airplane or something, oh, I love history. I just visited Gettysburg. You know, I mean, the Civil War is, it is our defining moment in some, I, I believe, you know, in our history. And there's not any narrative history out there like this. Um, there are some wonderful narratives of the Civil War written by single authors. Um, McPherson, Eric Foner, you know, so, some big name historians that I'm sure you have all their volumes in your collections. But there's nothing that does this with a variety of voices covering a huge variety of themes. Um, so as soon as I got this job and I knew I had to sign up some reference volumes, the Civil War was basically the first place I wanted to go. Um, so that, my bit of this talk is basically to give you guys a little back, you know, look backstage on how these things come to be. So. I did my market research and I did find um, a few handbooks, um, more companions. Aaron himself is the editor of the Wiley Companion to the Civil War. Um, I know, again, that there's a lot of, you know, big tomes by one writer on it, but I, you know, I did my market research and I was unable to find anything quite like this, which again is a three volume narrative history of the Civil War written by experts um, on their topics that they know best. So um, I identified a market need and then I had to find the right person to do it. And this actually, I feel like for someone in my shoes, it's, it's the hardest and most interesting part of the job when you when I, you know, it's not like somebody's bringing me an idea. It's my idea. I think we should publish this, but I have to find the right person to do it. And that person has to be well-connected, um, well-liked, because our wonderful contributors really do this largely as a service and hopefully a labor of love to the profession and beyond, you know, you, you're not, they're not able, they're not sending their kids to college on <laughs> what they're going to make these books. So, so 
the right editor for this has to be very well networked, um, well liked, and also have a really good handle on the topic and ideally some experience in doing a reference book. You know, um, academics write a lot of different kind of books, um, but a monograph is not a reference volume. A reference volume is not necessarily an intro level textbook or a synthesis. So, you know, so some of the best Civil War historians are people who I would never dream of asking because either they're too busy consulting on movies um, or they're churning out, you know, I'll just use some examples. Eric Foner is coming out with a book every other year on a big book on some aspect of the Civil War era and he is not going to have the time um, and probably the interest to do this. Um, you want someone who's at a certain point of their career if they are junior, pre-tenure, um, They've got to really be working on their own original research. Um, and often they're roped into a lot of committee work. So there is the time commitment and they just may have not been immersed in the field long enough to do that networking and know a wide range of people. Um, if someone is, I, I, I will not be ages, so I'll use the word August. I, I would not necessarily go after an August historian because this is, as Aaron will explain, this is, this is a lot of work and there's a lot of moving parts. And um, I know when I am an August editor, I am not going to want to do the kind of work that involves a lot of moving parts. I'm gonna to want to edit maybe three books a year. So, so then the search begins. Um, I started actually by speaking to, I did not know he was Aaron's advisor. Aaron, Gary was your advisor, right? That's correct, yeah. Um, so Aaron's advisor is a historian, was, is a historian named Gary Gallagher. He's at UVA and he is one of the preeminent um, scholars of the Civil War. Um, so I decided I was going to start at the top because at the very least I had a sense that Gary, if this is something he didn't want to do and I didn't really think he would want to do it because I think he is moving into that August camp, um, that he would be able to direct me to people who would. And that's exactly what happened. Um, I got very lucky here. Um, Gary did give, give me a list of a few people. I reached out to Aaron. Yeah, I did my homework and I saw that Aaron had recently published the Wiley Companion to the Civil War. So I said, aha, he understands the genre. Um, Sorry, I think I said Gary, I meant Aaron. <laughs> um, he knew how to do a book like this. He knew how to corral a lot of contributors because the companion, how, how many pages is the companion? It's huge, right? Yeah, it's two volumes um, and it's 61 chapters, I think. Yeah, uh, so. contributors. Yeah, so I knew Aaron would understand the culture of this. Um, Aaron also was one of the, I believe, inaugural journal editors of the Journal of the Civil War Era. Yeah. Um, that is a, it's not so new anymore, but it came out when, around 2010? Yeah, 2011, I think was our first issue year. Yeah, yeah. so this was, this was a new journal. Um, the other one, what is Civil War history, right? Yeah. Um, but the Journal of the Civil War era, I personally find very interesting because it's not just focusing on war. And as you will see, neither do these three volumes. It really deals with an era. Um, you know, this, the, it was a long civil war and some quarters is still being fought, I would say. Um, you know, witness the um, Confederate monument um, issues and how we commemorate the war. Um, so I like that he was on the ground level of the establishment of this new journal. I also knew that again, in his capacity as a journal editor, he, those networks, that he had the networks. When you're a journal editor, you, you need to know a lot of people. Um, so he, Baron basically seemed like my dream editor. And, and here, I think it was just probably a really nice um, constellation. the stars were right. I think, you know, Aaron can weigh in on this, you know, he had, time and interest. He had experience. You know, Aaron was able to come in already with his own workflows about how to do this. Every Cambridge history editor has their own way of getting things done. Um, I, I think I have six Cambridge histories in various stages of the pipeline. 
And every one of them, it's sort of the same thing. They're all multi-volume narrative histories on a big topic, but some of the Cambridge histories I have under contract, I have 12 editors, you know, that are handling all the different contributors. Aaron was a one man band and you have every, those are my two extremes, but it, what's most important to me is that when I'm finding an editor, that they are confident that they can make it work. And I'm, I'm, I will sometimes advise, well, 12 sounds like a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And also with Aaron, I said several times, you sure you can do this on your own? You sure you wouldn't rather be a general editor and then appoint three volume editors per volume? And Aaron said, you know, no, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. And, you know, any anyone like me, you know, we basically ultimately have to trust our authors. Um, and in this case, I did. And we, I, I think it went really seamlessly. Again, Aaron can talk more about hiccups because I basically just, you know, Aaron, Aaron worked pretty hard on a proposal. A lot of the early stages are crafting a proposal and really figuring out how to divide volumes up. And so now I, I hope I am controlling these slides properly. Where did it go? Where am I? Ah, whoa. Okay, how do I go back? Ah, okay. So we'll get into the weeds with these later, but this is a three volume set. And we have divided these thematically, um, so thematically and somewhat chronologically, but mainly thematically as opposed to working chronologically. Um, it's, it's, we decided that, you know, it, it was best to focus on how we wanted people to think about the war. Um, and it's longer history. And obviously it's a war, you want the battles. <laughs> so um, volume one um, is, as I said, all the battles all in one place. Um, these are, you know, we have the Gettysburgs and, you know, the um, Appomattox, if I pronounce that right, I always stumble over that, you know. But then we have, there are a lot of battles that some readers won't have heard about. There were, battles on, you know, rivers, you know, what one of our chapters is battles at sea or bat, bat, battle over war on water. You know, we have battles that took place in the West. We have how indigenous people were involved with battles. So, you know, we have Lee and Grant, but we have, you know, I, I think it's especially important in this day and age, we have the voices of those who have not traditionally been represented in a narrative history of the war. And I would argue, especially when it comes to military, you know, we have, you know, the easiest place to reconstruct history is in the words of the literate leaders who either wrote pieces or had things written about them. But what? how do you have a slave who might have fought in a Confederate battle create his own history. Um, so we do that here. We're getting, we get the voices of all the battles and really many of the people who fought them. And importantly, there's a real visual component here. All Camish histories, for those of you who are familiar with them, I, I think one of our, our bragging rights that we have with these are the maps. We have a wonderful cartographer named David Cox who has been doing our maps for years. He did them in this, but for a volume on war, you really need maps. <laughs> um, so we have many, many maps in the volumes, but especially this one, because um, you really need to map war. Um, I'll say one more thing on volume one. Um, I believe, but I can't be certain. Um, we we expect to sell more of these, you know. We we and 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 this I don't think would be so much with the audience I'm speaking to now, but perhaps in some of the public libraries or historical societies or battlefields, this is the battle volume. And, and if, if a buff is going to shell out the money for something like this, um, either now or later on when it comes out in paperback, we expect volume one 
to really speak to that crowd. So that, that was another strategic decision to put all of the battles in one volume. Um, okay, moving on to volume two. And this, this is where I think, Erin, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to call this and volume three, because basically the war part was easy, but then there are, you know, there's the issue of the politics of war. You know, wars don't usually start in isolation. You know, it's politics among a lot of other factors. And um, there was a long run up to this war that some of, some of us might argue started in, um, you know, right after we became a country. Um, so there's a long history of, you know, constitutional aspects that might have led to war. How do you secede? What are the rules to leave the country? What are, you know, what were the presidential campaigns? You know, where, where did war fit in campaigns? What were the fights in Congress going on? So um, we decided to have a second volume that we're calling loosely Affairs of the State. It's not just politics. We deal with um, some political ideology, I think economics. Um, the sectional issue, which basically this, the sections of the states, you know, North and South at war. So, you know, I summarize this as the politics and also really looking at those who made the war and why, you know, sort of the, the, the warmongers and their fellow travelers. And I think this one really gives us a sense of that there were two Americas, hence a civil war. There were two Americas brewing and there was just increasing gaps through the 19th century, you know, exploding in our civil war that some folks, I think, especially in the South, still call it the war, the war, the war of the states. Is that what, or the war between the states? Between the states. Yes. So, so, uh, you know, here we really play on, on states, statism, state actors, um, and that, for five years, we there were two different there were two different Americas, and they were at war. Um, and then volume three, which is my personal favorite, um, because I so I, I I'm a would be historian. Um, I was going to be a history professor. I decided to be an editor instead. But I have always been very interest interested in what I call home front or sort of off off the official battlefields. Um, war, when it happens, it's everywhere. You know, we, we know that it can seep into all aspects of life, be it that there's no food because the armies needed the crops you were growing. Um, you lost your home because they needed quarters. Um, you know, we know that a huge outpouring of cultural products came out of the war. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, Ken Burns' Civil War, art um and there are legacies i mean we are still fighting the civil war in so many ways I, I, you know and and the sectional divide um it's everywhere so volume three you know i i, I call it war in everyday life but everyday life I, I put a big umbrella on that to mean also culture you know high culture and popular culture and you know Again, monuments, veterans, um, disability, you know, everything that happens to the rest of us in war. So that took a long time. You know, we, we really went back and forth, we went back and forth of just what to call these volumes. I think once we figured out what we wanted to be in each volume, but then we had to figure out we wanted some nice synergy, you know, we wanted the titles to speak to each other. So it's really a long conversation and, and a nice negotiation. And then we sent it out to many experts in the field who offered suggestions um, based on um, Aaron's initial list of prospective chapter topics and prospective authors for them. Um, and they said, go for it. Um, and so, Aaron went for it, and now I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. I think I've covered everything just about, you know, what, what Aaron's been doing for the last, what, three years? <laughs> three years, while. right? That, which is, and I will say, this, so this, this was about three years in the making from um, the time I think we contracted it or around that time, um, maybe three and a half till now, and that's really fast. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, okay, uh, thank you, Debbie. And thank you to all of you who are here joining us on the webinar. Um, I appreciate you spending your afternoon or a little bit of it with us. I think I saw somebody from Marshall University. I was at West Virginia University for just a couple of years. So I'm happy to see West Virginians in the crowd. Um, so as Debbie said, there's three volumes. They are big volumes, um, 600 plus pages. So the shelf's gonna sag where the you get the whole set. Um, they are beautiful books as well, I will add as a bibliophile. Um, and as she said, they're organized, each, the, the volumes are organized uh, topically. And then within them, certainly in the first one, there's sort of a rough chronological organization. So I'm gonna say one more thing and then sort of talk through and show you some slides that, that show the table of contents and, and talk a little bit about how that was done. Debbie mentioned that I reached out to a lot of people um, more or less every civil war story in the United States, I was offered the opportunity to write or did write um, because there's 78 chapters and that's a lot of people. Um, and they are, I would say, the leading scholars of the Civil War. So there's a whole range of academics, um, both some junior people and also a lot of senior people and a lot of kind of mid-career scholars who are in between second and third books. Certainly in the first volume, there are a number of people from um, the National Park Service, folks who actually work on the battlefields about which they're writing. And so that helps us a lot because they're bringing a depth of experience about the landscape and about the experience and about communicating that to a, pro a broad audience that academics don't always have. And then there's also a range of other people, independent scholars, um, the Smithsonian, uh, there's people from a bunch of backgrounds where we really worked hard to find the people who know, for instance, the person who, the, the chapter on art, one of the chapters on art is written by a curator at the Smithsonian or a just retired curator. And so um, people that, that know these things very, very well. Um, so I want to show you um, and, and to talk a little bit about, so this is the table of contents for that first volume. Um, and as Debbie said, our goal here was to make something that covered the whole war. So it's both the Eastern Theater and the Western Theater and the Trans-Mississippi Theater. And I would say also beyond that, I mean, the Trans-Mississippi, as Civil War historians define it, is really just the Mississippi River to sort of the Eastern side of Texas. But in fact, those two last chapters, 27 and 28, the War in the West covers the Civil War um, across Glorieta Pass and the, and the battles that happen all the way out to the Pacific Coast. And then War in Indian Territory is both the literal space of Indian Territory, that is today's Oklahoma, but also the Sioux campaigns and the Sioux War in Minnesota and the Dakota Territories and conflicts in other parts of the West where indigenous people um, came into conflict with the U.S. Army. So um, our effort here was to be very capacious in terms of framing this in a, in a kind of spatial sense. And the other thing to note about these is that although these are, as you can see, pegged either to individual battles or to campaigns like the Antietam campaign or the Western theater in 1862-63, each of these offers a little bit of tactical, uh, that is to say on the ground kind of battle narrative, and then also often a broader strategic picture but they also, in many places, incorporate the home front into these, that is, the ways in which the people, for instance, the chapter on Fredericksburg, because that was really the first major battle that occurred in an urban space. You can't help but talk about the ways in which civilians come into a relationship with military violence when you're discussing Fredericksburg. Some of these authors also wanted to talk about the memory of these battles, that the, that the kind of long history of them has a particular shape in different places. So there's a uniformity here, which is that they all try to narrate these events in these places, and they do so chronologically. Um, they are synthetic in the best sense. That is, these are contemporary scholars drawing together the best and most recent scholarship, presenting that in an accessible narrative that also explains the outcome that offers for novice readers analytical hooks to understanding why did this event happen here? And what were the outcomes? What's the significance of Gettysburg as opposed to Vicksburg, uh, right? The typical narrative sort of hinges on, Vicks, on Gettysburg. But in fact, as Abraham Lincoln said, the control of the Mississippi River, which is a result of Vicksburg, is in some ways the more significant accomplishment in the middle of 1863. So there's some uniformity here, but there is also a little bit of variety in these essays, 
depending on how much space and how much time they're covering the Carolinas campaign, takes obviously several states into account, as opposed to something like um, Second Bull Run, which is really focused on one small part of Northern Virginia. But um, Debbie alluded to the, the naval chapters. So there's um, the war on the rivers. That is what the Civil War scholars talk about, the Brownwater Navy or the Brownwater conflict, mostly the interior rivers of the United States, particularly the Mississippi, Tennessee, Cumberland. And then the war on the waters, which is much more the, the fights that are going along the, along the coasts. So the creation by the United States of an Atlantic blockading squadron and a Gulf blockading squadron in order to impose a blockade and in order to constrict the ability of Confederates to get uh, access to supplies. The blockade specifically focuses on the blockade itself as opposed to the battles. Um, and then that last stretch, the chapters 23, 24, 25, um, and 26 really try to focus in on parts of the war that because they don't have marquee battles, um, often don't make the, the cut, but where millions of people lived and millions of people experienced war. And so for this, experts in these places sort of bore down and reframed the border, for instance, that is Southern Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and even parts of Western Pennsylvania, um, across the middle of Virginia, Maryland, um, Missouri, Northern uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, obviously, as a, a kind of discrete geographic space that shares some similarities. Um, the Deep South is, as it suggests, sort of Mississippi, Alabama, um, parts of Louisiana. So in each of these experts who had written extensively in those places, reframed the war and gave us chronologically an expansive chapter, 61 to 65 usually, but tried to do so with attention to the military events that are driving those, um, those narratives. The um, second volume, Affairs of State, um, is, as uh, Debbie said, our attempt to kind of roll back and then talk in those first couple of chapters about the impulses driving Americans into war. And then it spreads out very broadly from there and as she was talking, I, I wanted to, rem to, it reminded me to make this point, which I didn't have written down, which is that slavery is really in all of this. That is, um, slavery as an element of war, which very few Civil War historians today leave out. Even if you're writing traditional military history, you were talking about enslaved people as actors in that, either feeding intelligence to armies or as direct players or as part of the interaction between civil and military affairs. And so that's certainly true in the first volume. Nearly all of those chapters deal in some way or another with slavery. But I would say in every one of these chapters, slavery as a cause of the war or as a driving force in how the war is being fought as the North is moving itself closer to adopting emancipation as a war aim and the Confederacy is pushing against that. Um, those are, slavery is sort of um, part of all of these chapters. So while we have chapters um, in here on African-American political activism. And in the next um, volume, we have a chapter specifically on emancipation. Um, slavery isn't really partitioned in this. Slavery is a part of all of these. So this chapter, or this volume rather, begins with a sequence of chapters on um, sort of traditional military uh, issues, strategy, operation, and tactics, military leadership, technology, the structuring of armies. Um, then it moves into more sort of traditional statecraft. Um, and this is where I, I think we've got some of our most innovative essays. Um, it's not a surprise in a, a three volume set on the Civil War to have a chapter on Gettysburg, but the chapter on financing the war, which is written by a young scholar named Dave Thompson, who's got a great book coming out soon, um, really unpacks the way in which both sides organize their sort of economic arsenal and how did they finance the war in terms of taxes and bond sales and currency? How did they draw European investment? Um, so there's diplomacy involved in that. And of course, it's essential to know how um, you finance this war. This is one of the Confederacy's great weaknesses. Um, the story of occupation um, of the environmental war, this is another sort of new and emerging field in Civil War history. And so I, I deliberate, we deliberately created chapters here that are in some respects more speculative and, and chapters that I think will appeal not just to readers and students trying to find their way through the conflict, but actually to other faculty, both in Civil War history, but also environmental historians. That chapter on environmental war pulls together some of the emerging 
there's probably four or five key books, but then looks ahead and sort of speculates about what are the pathways for graduate students and for researchers to take that story and to think in broader ways about the environmental impact of the war. Medicine is another one of those that's a sort of emerging field. Um, we had tried, I did my best actually in the 16, 17 and what was gonna be 18 to frame the war globally as broadly as possible. It wound up not being possible to have the civil war in the Pacific, which was gonna be the perspective 18. Um, but the Americas is all of the Western hemisphere and that's a very um, sort of global chapter that thinks about the ways in which um, people in Latin America and in South America were involved in this, and particularly the ramifications, the fall of America's slave regime um, sort of sets the timer on the end for Cuba and Brazil. And so that, that chapter thinks about how Brazilians and Cubans, among others, are looking at the Civil War in the United States to try to understand what might be the future of slavery there. And then Europe broadens back and does more of the traditional diplomacy but in a much broader way, as do the succeeding chapters on politics, which is not just traditional high politics, but thinking about voting, thinking about the issues at the ground level, um, the imposition of martial law, what it means for a confederacy supposedly dedicated to state rights to also pass conscription and the first in American history and a tax in kind and the seizure of property and the ways, as Debbie said, for people on the home front, who may or may not be loyal Confederates, how do they engage with a government that they had hoped was going to be less repressive, but winds out being a Leviathan far beyond anything they had imagined. Um, um, more on uh, sort of dissent and outliers in both the North and the South, um, chapters on Lincoln and Davis as, as we would need in here, but in particular trying to balance those by thinking about the full range of political opinion in both these places. And then the third volume, um, which I now know is Debbie's favorite um, and which I will hopefully be able to move to, um, is, is um, more sort of social and also cultural, whoops, I went too far ahead, sorry, let me pull back, social and cultural history. Um, that is a preview of a map, which I was gonna get to in just a second. I'm having a little trouble with the controllers, so let me wait and see if we can pull back. Um, there we go. So hopefully that'll stand still. So as I say, sort of, you can see, particularly in those first many chapters, the kind of cultural dynamics of war. And I wanted to start with masculinity here, partly because we've had now several generations of very good, or at least several decades of very good writing on women and on gender in the war. And we're actually only just starting to get a serious reckoning with how the war reshapes American masculinity, not to give men pride of place in this, but there's one chapter on masculinity, two on women because the literature is so much more robust, but all the way through religion, um, economic and social values and families are, is a kind of way of wrestling both with how people encounter the war as people of faith um, uh, or as women or as men, but also how the war transformed gender norms and values, religious ideas, this is still a kind of understudied aspect. And so I think that chapter, which really deeply digs into the antebellum religious background will help point people in a future direction. The chapter, chapter five in this on um, economic values, which I sort of glibly call the market revolution goes to war is really a way to reckon with how people thought about economic value and, and economic values. Um, when soldiers enlisted in the civil war, they signed a contract which antebellum men knew what that meant. But of course, those contracts then changed during the war. If you enlisted for a year, you were automatically re-enlisted with the Draft Act. And so how did frameworks of thinking about economic value, about labor, uh, which is of course at the essence of this problem over whether the future is gonna be slave labor or free labor. Um, and then refugees, which I think will turn out to be a more salient um, chapter than we had imagined when we drafted it. Uh, but that covers both the movement of white and black people across the South um, in search of political and economic opportunity, obviously in search of freedom. Likewise, that citizen soldiers um, chapter um, written by one of our UK contributors. We have, I think, four or five um, authors who are UK academics that teach there, but study the US Civil War. That one thinks broadly about how new Americans came to fight in this and also what the war meant for those people as immigrant America in the Civil War suggests. How did it change patterns of immigration? What did it mean for 
um, recent Americans, principally Irish and German immigrants, but also from other places, and how did that shape their sense of belonging? More here, a sort of deeper dive onto emancipation and war and the black military experience. Um, the urban and rural chapter is really a kind of unique one that's written by Frank Towers um, and thinking seriously about how the war reshapes um, sort of civil and uh, uh, city and urban life in America. And then as, as Debbie alluded to, a whole range of chapters dealing with the legacies here. Legacies for the state, for law, in popular culture, whether visual or written, artistic memory, film, and, and finally public memory. So these chapters really, I think, set up the conversations that people are having today in public spaces about how we have memorialized the Civil War and what the, the kind of um, the deep history of that is. So I will uh, head towards a conclusion here just by pointing out some of the, what I think are the great features of this. Debbie had alluded to the maps. Um, uh, the maps are beautiful in their elegant simplicity, uh, right? They are not the kind of delicately cartouched um, uh, maps of the drawn by Civil War um, engineers, which are great for hanging on your wall, but actually impossible for students to read. Aaron, do you want to just say a few words about, you know, like what, how we, you know, what we had to tell, you know, how we got these maps? Because it's yeah, not so actually, so there's one map for every one of the chapters in the first volume. So there are 27 or 28, I think we have 27 chapters finally. So there's 27 maps there. Each of those authors are the ones who really brought to us the material that they wanted in the map. And then um, David Cox, as Debbie said, um, created these. We wanted a uniform look. Um, we wanted um, uh, railways in here and uh, waterways um, clearly marked. And then we wanted movement um, done in a way that was intelligible. This is a broader campaign map. This is actually from chapter 28. That's half. That's actually a double spread map that gives us all of the United States. So part of this was, was CUP devoting the resources to having large format maps. So these are not little boxes sort of above the start of a chapter. They are full page maps that are legible for students who I think are familiar with cartography, but also hopelessly dependent on, as we all are, on, on Google Maps. And so building the skills of reading maps um, requires consistency. And so the consistency of uh, symbols and of typology on these um, will help, I think, particularly for people that, that do multiple chapters, students will start to figure out, how do I read a map? This also just gives you a good sense of what the, that chapter 28 looks like in terms of, of native conflicts in the West. And then as Debbie alluded to, um, art. So there's a number of, of, we've got a whole bunch of artwork in here. We will actually have color plates, which is spectacular. Um, for some of the paintings, of course, um, people like Winslow Homer and Eastman Johnson, some of the most important 19th century American painters. So this has um, some of the iconic photos. This one famously that we know is a manipulated image, but nonetheless a very important one, the home of a rebel sharpshooter. And then I wanted to close with this image of a Kara Walker image um, that is a contemporary artist, right? One of the most important people doing, I would say, American art but somebody who's also deeply engaged with antebellum styles, right? The idea of the silhouette here and who actually does work centrally on slavery, on the war. Um, and so we included that uh, in that chapter on art as a way of reckoning with the continuing work that artists are doing here. So there's a broad range here of, of sort of features in this. And we think that that'll be a, a key part of helping draw um, readers in and, and help students understand the conflict. So that's what I wanted to say. We've got about 15 or 16 minutes left. Um, and so I think it's time for questions. And I think Leah is gonna, gonna come back in and help organize some of the questions that you all have for, uh, we'd be happy to offer, uh, answer Debbie or I. Thank you very much to Debbie and Aaron. That was great. Um, uh, I would invite our audience now to submit questions through either the, the Q&A icon um, at the bottom of your screen or you can send them in through the attendee chat. And I already have a couple here. Um, one question, I guess, the, about the maps uh, that Aaron was discussing. Can the maps be purchased separately? They cannot. So the, the maps are actually um, the property of 
Cambridge and they're copyrighted by that was a yeah Cambridge, so. a follow up to that was are there copyright issues yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> got it okay um this one might be for Aaron I'm not sure uh, is this appropriate for instruction how might an instructor use it to construct lesson plans so it is appropriate for instruction. I mean, the, the, we wrote it and, uh, and edited it and then rewrote it with an eye to making these chapters as accessible as possible, uh, really for lay readers, but especially for students who are coming to this topic. Um, and so it would be a lot to tell students you have to read all 1800 pages. Um, but chapters can provide, I think, particularly depending on how instructors organize the Civil War class, um, chapters could be selected to help gear them in a particular way, um, or if it's a class where the instructor is really doing the kind of military narrative with the uh, lectures that they might be giving, then pulling chapters from volumes two and three to help students gain a sense of the political and social and economic dimensions, or vice versa. I mean, a lot of people who mm -hmm. create and teach on the Civil War are actually more comfortable with the, 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 the political and sort of social dimensions and maybe aren't as comfortable with the military narrative. And so in that sense, you could, you could pick out certain chapters, particularly the campaign chapters that are geared broadly over several months and have students read those as background so that they understand when you come in to talk about the 1864 election, you've already read about the fighting in the Shenandoah Valley and Sherman's Carolina's campaign or the Georgia campaign so that you know how that election sort of goes. I would also add too that I, I hear again only anecdotally, but I hear it often that you know t those who are teaching courses on an area that they may know but they don't know everything, you know that that they consult the Cambridge histories. I mean, I have uh, you know we years ago we published I think a thirteen volume Cambridge history of Latin America, and I meet you know to this day people in other fields, non-Latin Americanists that say, huh, you know, I, I had to do my lecture on you know, mining in Chile for mm -hmm. a world history class and I went there. So, you know, teaching also involves prepping, you know, so it's not just student use, but how the teachers are going to use it and, and where they're gonna look. So, you know, I, I don't think we should discount, or I'm thinking here, you know, people who are teaching a military history class, you know, people who are at the military academies, you know, you got to cover a lot of wars and here it is for the Civil War. Thank you. Um, I saw Matt Branton had his hand raised. There was a button that was clicked. Matt, did you have a question? Um, if you want to, to put that into um, the attendee chat or the Q&A button. I just saw the hand raise icon there, but I didn't see a question. So let us know. Um, another one, um, what distinguishes this project from other one or even multi-volume histories of the Civil War already out there? Well, I can answer as an editor. I mean, Debbie alluded to the companion that I edited. So it might sound like I'm competing with myself. Um, the companion is historiography. Um, that the Wiley series, which is a great series, is really intended for faculty um, and teachers who are wanting to know the, the landscape. This is a narrative history. And as Debbie said, it's just so much bigger and broader and also deeper than any existing um, narrative that's out there. Um, I mean, M McPherson's book, Battle Cry of Freedom, is often assigned in classes. It's a pretty big book for students to get through. Um, on the other hand, it's also from 1988. So there's been a lot of scholarship since then and a lot of rethinking how we approach these. And frankly, a lot of our chapters have overlapped. Obviously, the war in the West and uh, wars in Indian, in Indian country sort of touch each other quite centrally. But what we wanted was people reflecting this new scholarship um, and not worried about when we overlap, because what you're going to get is slightly different takes on this. So I think in terms of its, of its currency um, and its framing, it's, it's hard to say that there's anything really comparable like it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, I, I, you know, as I said, the, there are narratives of the Civil I think a narrative of the Civil War, war be it McPherson, who, remain, who, who has the most comprehensive one. You know, first of all, a, a lot of most of most other narrative books on the Civil War are about an aspect 
or it's actually about the sectional crisis, which was before the Civil War, or, you know, it, it's about um, Reconstruction. You know, so, so this, uh, this has everything. Um, and, and again, I would say the multiplic multiplicity of voices um, is key. Aaron mentioned before the, diff the different ranges of people we have here, um, ranging from, you know, we have some very senior August scholars, um, and we also have some scholars who are at the assistant professor level, but, you know, just in their own graduate research, maybe their first book research, they just came across such an incredible trove of archival material that they are immediately the expert on that. We have, you know, the, 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 the former curator of the Smithsonian, you know, we have some public historians. So it's that breadth of voices. It's not just topics, but it's how you're going to tell that story from your perspective. You, you just, you, I don't think you get that anywhere else. And you know, not to trash the handbook models, but you know, I, I do, I have read them and I'm, I, I think they are very formulaic in terms of the writing. You just, you have to cover, you know, you have to have your bit on literature review and you have to have your bit on this. I mean, you, you, you've got to be more formulaic. I, I think the Cambridge history is, you know, the rule is accessibility, narrative, you know, show that you know your stuff, but don't bog it down with a lot of footnotes. And I really do feel like this is something that has stood the test of time with the Cambridge histories, um, is that, that unique combination of very different perspectives, but all writing in an accessible manner. And our editors like Aaron, who make sure that that's how it's written. I mean, the editors aren't just getting the chapters and then giving the, handing them over to us. I mean, there's a lot of edit, he is called an editor for a very good reason because he, he's editing and revise and having the authors revise. Great, thank you. Uh, another question: Is there coverage of movies that deal with the Civil War? There is. So there's actually a whole chapter on the Civil War in film, um, which which tries to take account of sort of the long run of. Um, you know, from, from early Lincoln to, uh, to the more recent films, I'm thinking of, you know, Henry Fonda and Young Mr. Lincoln. Um, but as one of the most important ways that Americans today know the Civil War, um, yeah, it's, it's essential. I and mean, that's in the Legacies chapter to think about sort of visual art, moving art, and sort of sculpture statuary as different ways that we have talked about and told the story of the war. And there again, I think it, it's an excellent teaching tool. I mean, when I was an undergrad, I took a course on film and history and, you know, there's your guide. You know, I mean, you have a piece right there that they're walking you through the film so you could basically form your lecture notes on that and then go have the students, you know, your, your, your watch list is right there. I think it's just full, the book is just, the volumes are full of Things like that, where it's it's not just the parameters of the story, but there are resources that you can easily find to supplement the teaching. Thank. You. Another question: Are there audio books available of these volumes? Not as of yet. <laughs> um, Cambridge is actually just we just completed a pilot a year about a year ago on. Um, we, we we are in. Um, doing more trade books, you know, more books for general readers of late and a component of that. Um, we were involved in a pilot from an audiobook company based in the UK and we liked what they gave us. So our, we are now using them, uh, but so far it's just for our general interest titles. Got it, thank this you. This would be a Herculean read. Yeah. I, I, would not, <laughs> I would not envy the reader. <laughs> Maybe we should just get James Earl Jones to read the whole thing. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, another question, has this project collected more scrutiny due to the political, the current political climate? Um, well, I don't know that it's collected more scrutiny, but I think we have given it more scrutiny, um, particularly that last section on legacies of the war. Um, uh, I mean, we, we, uh, Charlottesville and the events there were after we had done the bulk of this work, but um, 
I mean, the debates over monuments have been heating up, you know, and the flag issues have been heating up for the last decade at least. So I think those authors um, uh, were thinking about um, how to write in a way that engages what's happening now. You don't want to date the essay. And so, you know, it's partly about giving people a framework with which they can talk about the memory of the Civil War. I mean, Carrie Janey, who's really one of the experts on this, one of the leaders in the field, her final essay on, on public memory does that very broadly, talking about how over time, how have Americans come to this. Um, but all the essays on art and on literature and on film um, are, are, I think, quite aware of the stakes um, for talking about these issues. And so my hope is that um, yeah, for people who are maybe doing public history courses or are doing courses where they can see a way to talk about the Civil War and memory, but maybe don't know that much about the Civil War itself, those chapters will give them enough meat to enable class discussions about these particular things, depending on what medium they're interested in, in exploring. I would hope also just because of the timing, I mean, this is going to publish at the end of 2019, so it's going to be hot off the presses, you know, as we go into 2020 and election year, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I think we're at a juncture where there are two Americas right now, maybe more than two, but, you know, we, we throw around the, the phrase civil wars, um, and, you know, we, uh, I don't expect polarization to go away um, as we, in the run up to November 2020. And, you know, um, as someone who loves history and always thinks that the past informs the president needs to be called upon, you know, now's, now's, I think just what, if not now, when, you know, I mean, we were, we're facing, we're so polarized right now and it's going to get worse in this book's front list lifestyle, you know, front list calendar year. Thank you. Um, another one, can we purchase separate chapters with volume or within the volumes? Do you want to try? Okay. I don't believe so. So, you know, and, and probably um, some of our audiences know better than me do, than I do, because I'm just the editor and I don't sell the product. But, you know, we, um, we have um, Cambridge Histories Online, which is part of our, um, an option in our subscription packages um, that we sell to librarians. And, um, you know, you, you can get various Cambridge histories, but not at the chapter basis. Mm -hmm. That being said, if your institution um, has Cambridge Core, um, I believe patrons would be able to get PDFs of the chapters. Um, so I don't know, here's a good show of hands, actually, if you wanna do a little poll, who has Cambridge Core? Um, I would actually be very interested in seeing that. Um, so your your users can get PDFs of chapters if you have Cambridge Core, a subscription to Cambridge Core. <laughs> I'm getting coached by my marketing <laughs> manager who's sitting to my left. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, you can, again, put those in the Q&A box or in the attendee chat. I think we've gone, we've covered all the questions that have been submitted so far. Um, I'll wait a few minutes to see if there are any additional ones. And in the meantime, I'll say that this session is being recorded and the video and slides will be available on the Charleston Conference website shortly. Um, we'll email everyone who's registered with a link to that when it's uh, available. And we're also going to be emailing out a very short attendee survey. Uh, so just please give us some feedback on this session and how we did. Um, any suggestions for future topics, future speakers. Um, just let us know in that attendee survey. We'd be, be very grateful for that. Um, I have not seen any other questions come through. So Aaron or Debbie, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Anything we didn't cover in the Q&A? Um, I'll just add, you know, as an acquisitions editor, it is my job to try to get a good sense of your needs, um, what your patrons might be asking about, what you might be interested in. So, you know, if, if you ever have any 
thoughts on, hey, I'd really like to see a Cambridge history on X, mm-hmm. um, reach out. My Twitter handle is um, in the um, on these slides, and Leah can find me. You know, I mean, Cambridge is active in the Charleston conference, so. I will get word if there are any <laughs> suggestions. I just, again, I want to thank everybody um, and especially, you know, you for listening and especially Aaron. He has done a Herculean job and just listening to this and talking about it again, you know, when, when we've sort of been more bogged down with sort of the manufacturing and production issues, I, I, I'm just... I just can't wait to see this. And, and I, I hope that enthusiasm um, and commitment from Aaron and Aaron on, on behalf of his contributors has, has translated to you all. Yeah, Great. not much to add other than to say that too and, and appreciate you all participating in this and hope you'll take a look at it. All right, well, thanks again, Debbie and Aaron, and thanks to Cambridge University Press. Um, It's been great. Everybody have a wonderful day, and we'll see you at the next Charleston Conference webcast. Great, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.